So thanks for coming, everyone. Um, the first order of business actually is to finish up the talk from last week on this implementation of a Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so we have this bladder cancer data set, and we observe for each county in the US, about 3,000 of them, the number of deaths. And we also recorded the number of person years that we observed that county. So number of people times the number of years that each person was um, observed, all summed up. So here's the model right here. So we've got a Poisson distribution, a gamma distribution, gamma prior on the thetas, which are the mean death rates per county. And we have uniform priors in alpha and beta. The point here in this model, why I'm talking about this here is we can, in our Gibbs sampler for this model, when we're fitting this hierarchical model, all of these theta k's we can sample in parallel. We can sample them all at the same time because we're assuming that these theta k's are independent and the y's are independent. So just to remind you, the idea of the Gibbs sampler is we want to separate, we want to sample from the joint posterior distribution of all these parameters by iteratively sampling from the full conditional distributions of alpha and beta in each of the theta k's. All the theta k's can be sampled at once because, again, they're independent, so we can parallelize that whole calculation. And you can derive the full conditionals. Each theta k is a gamma distribution. Alpha is this ugly looking, has this ugly looking density that we're gonna need a random walk metropolis for. And then we've got a truncated gamma distribution for a beta, but depending on the data set, we can take the, the uh, upper bound to be really huge and approximate this just by any old gamma distribution, which in the implementation is what Zeb and I have done. So you can look at the summary of the Gibbs sampler here. I'm not gonna go over it, but for you guys, here's a text summary absence of my words. And here are the steps for a really good rejection sampler for gamma distribution, which, which uh, Zeb used when he put this implementation together. Um, it's a rejection sampler, and I'm not gonna go over the specific steps, but the acceptance rate is at least 95%, and often better than 95% when the shape parameter is greater than or equal to one. The rate parameter doesn't matter because you can just divide the observations by your rate parameter to, to either divide or multiply by the rate parameter to get um, to sample from you know gamma distributions with different rate parameters. So I'm not going to go through that. What I want to get to for today is the implementation. Last thing is that for the metropolis step for alpha, we compute, we draw this alpha star from this proposal distribution which is a normal distribution. And we compute an acceptance probability that depends on evaluating the density of alpha at this proposal and the density of alpha at the last value that we sampled, the uh, alpha, alpha j. We compute this acceptance probability. Here's the form of the acceptance probability. So when we dig into the code, this quantity should look familiar in our sampler of alpha. And we accept this theta star with probability p. And we just keep going until we get an, we get a, well, no, we don't keep going until we get a new value because, I mean, if we accept this value of alpha star, that's our alpha j plus one. Otherwise, we take the last value we got to be our alpha j plus one. So this only needs one iteration. Even if we fail to accept, we still move on right away. All right, to the code, which I didn't have time to go over last time. So uh, Zeb here created it. Um, he did nearly all of the work. I modified it a little bit, and I'll show you um, the modification, some of the modifications on the way. Um, a good description of how to use this is here. Um, it's really straightforward if you know anything about Linux or running C programs and from the command line. Um, real easy. So, beginning of actual code. Standard libraries, code.h, math.h, pretty simple. 
Coran.h is Coran kernel.h is important for the device API for this library called Kurand. Now Kurand is a library that I'll devote an entire talk to later that just deals with generating random numbers from this one library. It's very useful. You can generate a lot of numbers in parallel. Thrust, like I said before, I'm going to devote another whole talk to Thrust. This is what our uh, next include statement talks about. Um, so Thrust is the CUDA C, C++ analog of the standard template library. It has a lot of parallelized algorithms like reductions, including the pairwise sum. I'm using the pairwise sum and the pairwise product in this code. Um, Zeb coded them by hand. I'm, I modified the code to call thrust instead. And then I'm including thrust reduce in order to use those reductions. Um, I don't know if, if changing to the thrust implementation actually uh, had a speed up for this data set. Now, um, I guess there might be a speed up if you're, if you're going to different data sets and you need different, different proportions of blocks to threads, and Thrust might take care of that and they might optimize it differently. Um, in the previous implementation, you sort of had to optimize it by hand, which, which I, think, I think you did. For, is that right? Right, right, yeah. OK. So that wasn't optimized, but what's that? Yeah, yeah, that was just a pairwise sum and a pairwise product. But Thrust might have some sort of optimization. I would expect them to. It's a really good package that a lot of people use. And we have macros for pi, and we have 64 threads per block, which is the last line in this macro. Now, um, 64, you always want to have the number of threads per block be a power of, be a multiple of 32, for reasons that I'm not going to go into now. I'll probably get to that next week. But there are these things called warps that you want to worry about. That's the short answer. Not informative, but that's the short answer. So, all right. Wrappers around built-in CUDA and CURAND functions. So CUDA call you've seen before. It just is a wrapper around every call to CUDA malloc, uh, CUDA memcopy, and CUDA free. This is really useful error checking stuff. And it'll even tell you, as uh, Dr. Marsinga and I talked about, if, if there is no CUDA capable device hooked up. It will tell you that too, and that's very important. Sometimes you're, you're, if, there's, if no GPU is actually hooked up but you have the right software, the program will spit out garbage and you won't know why. It could turn out that there's just no device hooked up. And so you want, you want some sort of error message. These are, uh, I'm going to keep telling these stories. I've got plenty of them. Do error checking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you don't want 1 plus 0 equal to minus 32,000. Not knowing why. <laughs> I don't know what modular arithmetic is on your planet. <laughs> All right, so you've got the same thing for calls to Kuran as well. So Kuran generates random numbers. It has its own system for, for error codes and all sorts of useful stuff for telling you what went wrong. And Kuran call is a special wrapper around Kuran calls for that reason. It, it works exactly the same way as CUDA call does. Hmm. Well, how do you mean? They generate random bits. Yeah. So that happens on the GPU. You specify a number, uh, a number of, an amount of, well, a number of random numbers that you want and it does them all in parallel. You have to initialize multiple random number generators, though. That's, that's, that, that's the key thing. And then each number generator gets assigned to a thread, and all those threads execute simultaneously. I answer your question? Great. And so we have a whole lot of functions. So sample A and sample B, sample alpha and beta. We have built-in random number generators, because QRAN only gives us random bits. Right? 
And there are built-in functions to give you normal distributions and Poisson distributions, but um, it's writing a normal sampler is really easy because it's just the box Muller transformation. Gamma is non-trivial, but for some reason, NVIDIA doesn't give it to us, so hence, you know, we have to write our own ga gamma samplers. Um, sampling theta is a kernel. Notice this double underscore global. That's because we're each instance of this kernel samples a, a given death rate for a given county, and we do you that sampling for multiple counties. And setup kernel initializes all the um, random number generators that we'll need. So the idea behind, like I said before, Kuran samples random numbers in parallel because the idea is you you construct you know hundreds or thousands of random number generators and then call those random number generators independently. Ordinarily, we need to call them sequentially because random numbers you. When you use random numbers, you have to you, pseudo random numbers. You have to hop through the pseudo random sequence. If you, have, if you have separate independent sequences, then you can do that all in parallel. Okay, so you have these dev states. Those are the states of a random number generators. Those are you need to keep track of. Um, I'm not going to go over a bunch of this uh, this setup code. It's just a bunch of CUDA malloc's and mem copies. Um, this is your part of your setup kernel. So threads per block, remember, is 64. And K, capital K, is the number of counties. So you would scale up the, the problem in the number of blocks, not the number of threads per block in this case. Um, that's often a very good choice. Because the number of threads per block is much smaller, typically, than the number of blocks total. And then setup kernel initializes the, the random number generators, and you pass in the vector of states to do that. Or the, sorry, the array of states. We're not in math anymore, we're in comp sci. Vector, uh, array of states. Okay, so the MCMC is entirely in this loop. We call the sample theta on the number of blocks and threads per block because that's the kernel, and it samples these uh, dev theta and dev log theta those are all the thetas, right? All of the death rates, the, the average death rates. It's, it's sim simulating from those conditional distributions all in parallel, which is really nice. Now I store the thetas and the log thetas because they're convenient for later. To compute sufficient statistics, you're going to need to sum. You're going to need to have the sum of all the thetas and the sum of all the log thetas. And the sum of all the log thetas is just the log of the product of the thetas, right? So I'm computing the acceptance probability for the random walk metropolis step on the log scale. So that's why I need those. On that note, I, one of the modifications I made was to replace um, these sums and this pairwise sum and pairwise product for those sufficient statistics using thrust. What I do is I cast dev theta and dev log theta into two device vectors. I'll get more into what that means. They're objects not entirely unlike arrays, according to the paradigm in the thrust library. And theta and log theta are these vectors. And I call thrust reduce on theta and log theta to compute the pairwise sum of each. And so I just call. This whole pairwise sum, you know, worrying, you know, these, the, you know, several lines of code that you would have to think about, you know, how many blocks, how many threads per block do I need? You don't need to worry about that stuff if you just call thrust reduce with one line. It's pretty cool. And I've got a flat sum of the thetas and the sum of the log thetas out of this. And I use these to compute sufficient statistics. So when I sample from alpha, I just pass in this sufficient statistic. When I sample beta, I just compute this one. So we're iteratively, to, to kind of go back and look at this, the big picture here, we're iteratively sampling from the thetas and the alphas and betas. And these two functions, the alpha and beta samplers, they are computed on the CPU because we're only, we're doing them sequentially. We don't need the GPU for them. Um, 
Sample theta, that's a kernel. Remember this triple bracket notation? That's the number of blocks and number of threads per block we're using? That's on the GPU because, we, again, we want to sample the thetas all independently. And then we free everything and we're done. Um, I'm going to speed through this, these samplers here. So sampling alpha is just this, this metropolis step that we were talking about. Sampling beta is just from a gamma distribution. That's why R gamma is here. And hyper A and hyper B are just the hyperparameters of that specific gamma distribution for beta. Um, R norm, that's a box molar transformation. We have a host copy, and we have a device copy, as you'll see later. And here's the gamma sampler, that rejection sampler with a really good acceptance rate. Now we have a device R gamma, which instead of R norm here and rand here, we have qrand normal, which is a built-in function in the qrand library for generating a normal distribution, uh, sampling from a normal distribution. And then there's qrand uniform as well, which is exactly what you think it is. And I pass in the state of the random number generator each time I use it. And state is really a vector of states. And id is the id state that we have. And id is actually going to be the thread index that we're using. So we're going to calculate multiple normals and uniforms you know, in parallel. When we can. Why do we need uniform here? Because, well, we computed a, um, well, I'm not sure, but in other situations, I would say that we compute some acceptance probability, and we accept or reject um, based on that probability. And so I sample uniform to, um, you know, to say, well, if u is less than p, then we, reject, then we accept. If u is greater than p, we reject. That's a very common rejection sampling thing. That makes sense? It's Yes. Right. I don't quite understand your question then. Yes. Yes. So the bits themselves are, are uniform, but depending on how you represent them, they could be, you know, integers from from you know zero to two hundred fifty six minus one, or you know, uniform zero one real numbers. Um, Kuran uniform takes care of the, that scaling that you need. Right. You can sim you can sample uniform uh, you can sample random bits instead if you want to. There's there's I mean. Just the function qrand, I think, um, if I'm remembering this correctly, will just give you the bits um, and whatever, and I think an integer data type, an int data type. Um, qrand uniform just gives you the number you want if you're looking to sample from normal zero one, or from uniform zero one. That make sense? Yeah? They're not the same. Actually, a state is sort of, so a seed is used to initialize the state and a bunch of other things. So it's not exactly, they're not exactly the same, but they're highly related. Um, it's, you would, yeah. And so you can. Yes, when you create these things, you will give it a seed, and then it'll create the states from the seed. And the states keep track of where you are in the pseudo-random sequence. Good. All right. Notice we also have, well, so we have the theta sampler, which relies on R gamma here. And set up kernel, like I said to Jared, you have you have a seed that you need to use. You can use the same seed for every pseudorandom sequence, or you could give it multiple seeds. It doesn't really matter. Um, in this case, you pass in one seed, and qrand init creates all these states from the seed, and a 
couple other things which I'm, which I'm not going to go over until Kuran, the Kuran talk. Uh, needless to say, ID is the index of the thread, of the current thread within all the threads and all the blocks combined. So you can think of ID as a thread index, and the ID state here is being initialized. Um, the only error I found in this code was right here in the last two lines. I, you needed to add the, the condition that ID is less than K, otherwise um, ID went out of bounds. And I didn't discover that until I ran CUDA memcheck on it. And so that was, that was something that's really hard. Another, another advertisement I can make for CUDA memcheck. So always check, always check if your threads, if your thread indices are, are within the legal bounds of your arrays. And run with CUDA memcheck. So in this case, I ran this. I compiled and ran, no errors. Always, always, always check with CUDA memcheck. You just type in CUDA memcheck and then run, it, run whatever commands you want. Notice my arguments just fall right afterwards. Perfectly fine. You can just type in what you want. Um, let's go back to compilation for a second because this, you run NBCC. Sometimes you need to say, uh, you, need, you need to use this arch flag. SM20, I think, ensures that the, co the compute capability is at least two. Now, compute capability is kind of like hardware, software versioning. And so later compute capabilities can do more than earlier compute capabilities. And you want this program to assume compute capability of at least two to take full advantage of the features um, in this program and to work properly um, before you compile. You'll often need to do that. And Valgrind, same thing. You get a couple of warnings, and uh, it thinks that there's some memory leaked, but really doesn't matter in this case. That's just because it doesn't know about GPUs. And what you really want to see is error summary, zero errors from zero context from Valgrind. That's, that's what, um, what you want. Now I can run the two chains for real. I can run this um, 10,000 times, put it into chain one, or another 10,000 times, put the results into chain two. So these are sequential chains. Now you can diagnose these, and don't have really time to go into this, but there's this thing called the Gelman Rubin, Gelman Rubin Potential scale, scale Reduction Factor. I just call them the Gelman Factors because I find them hard to find the name pretty long-winded. There are these R hats, which use the W between or within chain variability and B between chain variability. You can look at Gelman's book for a bigger discussion, a longer discussion about Gelman factors. Short answer is R hat greater than 1.1 is evidence of lack of convergence. R hat less than or equal to 1.1 is not evidence of convergence, but it's it's a good sign anyway, and that people like to use. So I ran this with two chains, and I got Gelman factors for alpha and beta to be less than 1.1, no evidence of lack of convergence from this heuristic, and I did. Uh, trace plots and histograms of the distributions, and they look they look okay to me. They look like maybe I didn't get stuck in a mode, as far as I know. Um, you want these trace plots to fluctuate. After all, you're generating random numbers. You don't want them to. You don't want to get stuck flat for a long time, or to drift off into the sunset. For more info on this, you can go read Andrew Gelman's book. It's in the sources. You can also download the code. That was yesterday's talk. I don't really have much time for today's talk, but I'm going to go over briefly, um, see if I can get it done in 25 minutes. So the goals, original goals of today's lecture were on performance measurement and types of memory. Now, performance measurement is really simple. I'm going to just speed through that. So how to time kernels on the GPU. Well, let's first of all compare to how to time kernels, how to time code in the CPU. You use time.h. There's a clock type, and you set start to be this output of this clock function, which gives you the time. And you run some code, and you compute clock minus start. Divide by clocks per second, because the measures clock outputs the, uh, the numbers in units of clocks, not uh, seconds. So you need to convert. And you print out the elapsed time. Pretty simple. In CUDA-C, it's, it's 
analogous, but there are some synchronization issues you have to worry about too. So um, you, can you can just copy and paste this code and it works. So um, an event is a timestamp, and there's this special event type for your start and stop stamps or events. Those are, those are checkpoints um, for your code. You have to create them formally once you, um, or these are, by create, they really mean initialize. So you're, you're creating, you're declaring start and stop here as CUDA events. You're creating or initializing them by passing them by reference in this function. And then you record some start, the starting event. Do some work. This could be a kernel, a CUDA mem copy, CUDA uh, malloc, whatever you want inside here. And then you record the stop timestamp. Usually it would be done, but suppose you want to you want to time more things, right? The start and stop. You would have to synchronize the CPU and the GPU again. So you call this CUDA event synchronize on stop in order to make sure to avoid sort of this asynchronous business. So it turns out the CPU and GPU um, execute this program asynchronously. So the CPU doesn't wait, doesn't always wait for this kernel to get done before it executes CPU code, right? Um, kernels execute sequentially themselves, but code in the CPU doesn't always execute sequentially with, with kernels. So you have to worry about that, um, which is why you would call CUDA events synchronized to make sure you have accurate readings. Now, um, this may slow your code down. So you may want to only do this when you're debugging something or finding more opportunities for parallelism. Um, sometimes, you don't want to do this all the time. Um, you compute, but after that, you compute elapsed time, you destroy your start and stop events that freeze your memory, and then you print out the elapsed time. So there's an example here where I time the pairwise sum using this code, and I've already gone through this, but long story short, I wrap this code this CUDA event create business and the things afterwards around this PSUM kernel. And I time the uh, execution time of that. I run it. I compare it to the linear sum. And I compare it to the, sorry, I compare it to the CPU version of equivalent GPU versions of this pairwise sum and the equivalent linear sum. GPU is a little slower because I ran it with small data, and there's a lot of overhead when you start computing something on the GPU. So that's timing things on the kernel. You can look up this code online if you want to know sort of more information, but it's really you copy and paste this code into your program, and it works. Pretty simple. Not in this case. In this case, I'm just timing the kernel. Yes, because Everything in between this block and this block of, of code is what I'm what I'm timing. And I'm only time and the only thing in between here is this. So memory. This is the important bit from today. So there are three kinds of memory. Well, actually multiple, but three main groupings of memory. Things that are private for each thread things that are private for each block, and things that are shared by all threads and all blocks. So each thread gets its own little box of registers and local memory. These are things that this thread and only this thread has access to. If I create new variables within a kernel, let's say I have a variable x that I say, you know, int x equals 0 inside a kernel, right? Then thread 0 will have its own copy of x, thread 1 will have its own copy of x, and so on. There will be actually four copies of x. And when I say, you know, x equals 5, well, that's actually that operation of assignment, assigning the value 5 to the variable x, will happen four times in this case. Now, x can be stored in local memory or can be stored in registers. Things that are stored in registers are easier to access and they're faster to access. Um, local memory takes a little bit more time. There, there might be a way to micromanage what goes into registers and what goes into local memory, 
but I haven't looked up how to do that because I trust NVIDIA's automatic optimization of this um, more than I trust my own judgment. I mean, I think you would have to know a lot about compilers in order to do this well. Now there's this also thing called shared memory because you know if I can if I can give each thread its own private copy of a variable, why not give each block its own copy of another variable? Let's say let's say I have a variable y and I declared it to be a shared variable, right? There's going to be a copy of y here and a copy of y here, and over here in this block, thread zero and thread one are sharing the same copy of y. That could be trouble because because thread because thread 0 over here and thread 1 over here can't write to y at the same time like they can to x, right? And same thing over here. There's another copy of y. And I can declare shared variables inside kernels. And I'll show you how to do that. It's real easy. Now, global memory is anything, things that are in global memory are anything that you pass by, that you, that you initialize with um, and create memory for with CUDA malloc and maybe initially assign the values to with CUDA mem copy. Um, that is what's in global memory. And all the threads and all the blocks shared ev share everything that you create with global memory. That's, that's again, the CUDA mem copy, CUDA malloc. Those are managing things in global memory. And any pointers that you pass into kernels point to global memory. So here's an example. Here's, here's my kernel. And I've, I pass in a something in global memory, B global and T global. And down here, B global and T global and B global are the thread ID in, within the block and the block ID respectively. Right? But also, I create B local and T local. And I assign the same values here. Now, T and B are something altogether different because I declare these to be shared variables. All you have to do is have this double underscore shared inserted here in order to create shared variables. And I do the same, th same thing here. All right, so, whoops, I wanted to step through this, but I don't have really much time. Needless to say, so B local and T local Remember, each thread in each block gets a copy. Now, remember represent, I'm representing each thread this way with, you know, as an ordered pair with the block ID and the thread ID per block and within that block, um, just to explain this. So, so B local, there's one copy per thread. So we're guaranteed that, you know, B local is going to get the value of its block and T local is going to get the value of its thread within that block. B shared and T shared are a bit different. So there's one copy of B shared per block and one copy of T shared in that block as well. So just looking at B shared, um, each thread is going to write the same value to B shared within, within the block, right? So, um, these are correct, these values. T shared, a little bit different though, because if you have two threads in the same block, they're going to try to write to the same memory location. Because T shared, you get one copy of T shared in block zero, one copy of T shared in block one, and both threads in block zero are trying to write their thread IDs to T shared. And same thing over here in block one. And they're competing to write to that value. And you don't know which thread's going to win out. This may be a bit abstract, but. Um, yes. So if thread, if thread zero goes in and writes its value zero to T shared and then leaves, Great, but thread one is going to come in later and overwrite that value with its thread ID, one, and then leaves. And so the final value of T shared is going to be one. But you don't know if thread zero or thread one is going to finish last. So you really don't know what's going to be here. 
That's a race condition. We'll get to those next week in a little bit more detail. And B global and T global, you don't really know. You, you know even less because for these, there is only one copy of B global for all the threads and all the blocks. And same thing for T global. And they're all competing to write to the same thing because there's only one copy. So you really want to pay attention to how many copies of your objects are you know, in, in memory and which copies are you know, particular to each thread or shared by multiple threads. So you don't run into situations like this. That's not to say you should always use local memory, though. Sometimes you won't have to. Sometimes it'll be really inefficient to copy things over to local memory. There are uses for each kind of memory. And we can go over an example of this right now, where we use all three kinds of memory, shared, global, and local. So take the dot product, for example. So here's my, here's my algorithm. So I take a vector of length 16, another vector of length 16, and I want to compute the sum of the pairwise products, which is the dot product. And I'm going to use two blocks and four threads per block for this purpose. Now, when I talked about the dot product earlier, I only used one block and, let's say, eight threads per block. But sometimes vectors get so big that you can't use just one block because there aren't very many threads per block that you get. So you may have to do this calculation over multiple blocks, and shared memory allows us to do that very easily. So so we give a subvector to each block. Each block computes the dot product on that, long story short. So what you do is you have this, this shared variable called the cache, which I call, which I call cache, and the book by Sanders and Kandrat calls this cache as well. I took this right out of his book. Cache is this array in shared memory. So block 0 gets a copy, block 1 gets a copy. And this cache is shared by all the threads in the block. And I, com I compute a bunch of pairwise products and sum them up and put them into this cache. I compute the pairwise sum of all the things in the cache within each block, store that in the initial element of cache. And then what I do is I write these values back to another array. So cache 0 is in block 0. And cache 0, there's also a copy of that in block 1. I transfer these values over to something in global memory so I can write these partial sums back to the CPU. You can only write things back if they're in global memory, right? So I need to store these things in this array in global memory and then sum these things up, and the pairwise sum of partial c is the final answer. Local to blocks, that's a good way of paraphrasing it. Where you would technically say shared, but yes, they are local to, block, to each block. Yes. All the threads in block 0 access this cache. All threads in block 1 access this cache. They're both called the same thing, though. Yes. Yep, that's encoded in the kernel. So I would say shared in star cache, you know, as, as my declaration. OK, here's the code. I took this right out of Sanders and Kandrat, and they have this header file called book.h that I included. And it should be up online. Um, now, I'm just going to jump right to this kernel here. So I have a vector of floats, and sorry, an array of floats, an array of floats, A and B. I want to compute their dot product partially and store these partial pairwise, these partial sums of products in this global array partial C. And remember, cache was supposed to be a shared. Uh, array, so I declare double underscore shared double underscore float cache, and I want the cache to have length threads per block. So in this example here, 
There were four threads for block zero, four threads for block one. Has length four, has length four. Same idea here. And TID now is the total thread index. Cache index is a thread index, and temp is going to be zero here because temp is going to store a bunch of um, sums of things. Now, this while loop here takes a pair, one pairwise product, stores it in temp, and then I offset by the total number of threads in the grid, and then compute another pairwise product, sum it up in temp, offset again by the total number of threads per grid, per this kernel. And then I compute another pairwise uh, product, sum that to the running total, and then that running total temp is going to be what's stored in the cache at that thread for that block. So implicitly, cache is really, another way to think about this is that cache is implicitly indexed by block as well, because there's a copy of cache per block. Since there's a copy of ca different copy of cache per block, you don't really need to include a block index, but you need to include a thread index, because all the threads have access to this. Now here's what I'm doing. So there's a cache for block 0, cache for block 1. Here are my two vectors. I'm computing these two pairwise products, storing them in cache 2, cache, sorry, cache 0, and I'm stepping through. So this is what the first thread does. This is what the second thread does. Third thread and fourth thread per block. I'm just taking these, these pairwise products, summing them up. And I'm offsetting by 8, which is the number of threads in that kernel call. That's so these four threads that I just looped through are what this first block does. But this vector is so long that just that first block isn't going to get isn't going to get through the whole length of the vector. The second block has four threads, one, two, three, four threads. And then it takes care of those sums of pairwise products for the rest of the vector. That makes sense? And I can represent the memory like this, again, because cache is a shared variable. All right. Next thing to do. Yes? Yes. How far? Yes. Uh, you think that that's going to be a function of the thread? Mm. To do what part of the while loop? To be advancing in the indexing system? Well, there might be. Well, you could you could turn this into a for loop. You could you could turn this into a for loop and just increment by this much. But I copied the book's, the book's code, and the book had a while loop in there. By the way, the part of the while loop is the part that jumps from here to here per that thread. So the, here's the first iteration of the while loop. Here's the second iteration. And depending on the offset that you jump through, that's sort of how you might tailor this to your algorithm. Um, Let's go. So I could have, I could have, depending on the number of blocks I had, depending on how I want to parallelize this, I could have a different offset here. I could, I could easily, I could just as easily define, you know, an offset of one, and just compute these two pairwise products first. It's just not as, not as clean when you actually write the code. So let's go back to the future. All right. Now, remember when you. Next step, these are all the pairwise product, the, these are all the partial sums of pairwise products that I'm going to need, right? And so I want to take the pairwise sum of this and the pairwise sum of this. But remember, in order to do those things, I need to make sure that we have successfully computed or finished computing all these things and all these things before I move on. So I'm going to synchronize all the threads within, the, within this block. 
And then I'm going to do this pairwise sum. We went over the code for pairwise sum, so I won't go over it again. But this computes the pairwise sum of cache for each block and stores the result in the zeroth index, in the value at the zeroth index of cache. I store all the results in partial C. So the block ID element of partial C is going to have that corresponding block's copy of cache of zero. Because cache of zero is shared. Again, that's how you use shared memory. So what this code is doing again is you know, for each block, this is block zero, it's computing the pairwise sum. So I get one sum and another sum. And they're each stored again in this cache variable. Sync threads, and then I finish the pairwise sum. So that's a review of pairwise sum code as, as applied to, to here. And I'm not going to go over it too much. You've already seen pairwise sum. Now I copy. I'm not done. I'm done my work on the GPU, but I'm not done overall. Because what I need to do is I need to copy partial C back to the host back to the CPU. Um, so I do CUDA mem copy of dev partial C, which is partial C in the device that I just computed, copy to partial C, and then I finish up on the CPU side. I just take a linear, I'm, I'm lazy here, so I just take a linear sum of partial C. And if you're not actually using parallel code, you might as well just use the linear sum, because the pairwise sum won't really uh, make that much, make as much of a difference as if you did, you know, on the, on the GPU. So, and then C is the final dot product. Um, you can run this code online. It's posted um, on, on the website for this talk. So, we went over timing kernels on the GPU. Little, little trick for when you're, when you're doing your code and you want to prove that, hey, there is a speed up here. Well, you might want to have evidence for that. We also went over memory. So memory is, I mean, you've got to be able to, to avoid race conditions and to really make your programs run fast. You've got to know what memory you're talking about and, you know, uh, you got to be able to use it correctly. And I think it's kind of nice and elegant that there's, you know, Thread-specific memory, block-specific memory, and grid-specific memory. That's really that's one of the one of the more elegant parts of um, GPU computing in CUDA C that I can think of. Um, just just in your to have in your toolkit at the hardware level. There is also constant memory and texture memory, things that I don't know how to use. But if you're really serious about speeding up your code and want to really polish your programs, you're going to want to take a look at those things. Anyway, yes, the arrows are in only one direction for a reason, because you can't overwrite uh, texture memory. So you're talking about this diagram, right? Yeah, double arrows, whoops. Double arrows for registers, shared memory, local memory, global memory. One arrow for constant memory, one arrow for texture memory. Because those, you have to write to them from the, GPU, from the CPU side, and you can't overwrite them ever again. But things are fast when you use them. That was really astute of you to notice. Did you know about texture memory and stuff beforehand? No? Yeah, good eyes. I didn't pick up on that. And I found out what constant texture memory were from other reasons. There are probably more kinds of memory, too. Uh, you can get really fancy with it. You might have to delve into the graphics paradigm to actually do it, though. I know, um, which isn't really bad if you're writing something like a, like a ray tracer, but um, it gets less intuitive. So I took the dot product example from Sanders and Kendrot. They have a book, Kuda by Example. It's a very good book. Also a very good book, uh, Kirk and Wu and Wen, uh, Wenmei. They've, uh, their text is very good. Kind of fills in a lot of the gaps of Sanders and Kendra because their book is, is largely by example. The Kirk and Wu book 
puts things you know, more in an organized way, very pedantic, but less examples. Um, I got a diagram from these guys, and the code that I went over today is online. I actually finished close to on time today. Oh, series materials, videos, slides, code, all available here, schedule of talks, and thanks for coming. And thank you, Zeb, for the parallel uh, MCMC code. That was extremely helpful, and I'm glad I didn't have to write that all myself. <laughs>